thank you all for coming. And um, Robin is asking to do the land acknowledgement, and uh, it, it's pretty special to me because I, I grew up in Saskatoon. Um, very little knowledge of the Indigenous people and their history other than uh, the real resistance and uh, bus trips to the Tosh and things like that. And I also come from British Columbia where there were no historical treaties and there's been a long process involved there to deal with it. So, um, of course, I, having not done an acknowledgement in, uh, for Treaty 4, uh, you know, asked Robin for the acknowledgement and, uh, and uh, uh, again, just to acknowledge we are on Treaty 4 land. Um, we have to have a relationship between the Indigenous people and come together today on this in a public uh, space. Uh, so it's the traditional territory. And I hope they get this out. The, the Cree, the Solto, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the Blackfeet and Blackfoot. And of course, we acknowledge the Métis Nation and honor their contributions <coughs> and, and place in history. Uh, and certainly the museum has done a good job of, of reaching out to the community and will continue to do so. So uh, we have benefits and responsibilities under the treaty and we have to work together on a path towards reconciliation. So I think in, in that context, um, we put uh, the rockets and we go, well, why is it important to have this in the museum? Why is it important that we talk about this? And we put it in the context of there's a group of uh, not only in the community spirit, starting the tournament in 1947, uh, post-war, after some pre-war uh, baseball, obviously, in Indian Head, but the arrival of African-American players from Jacksonville, Florida, later from the Bay Area, other players, uh, and the interaction of those players with the community. And I think that's what we need to understand in the context of Indian Head as a community, Saskatchewan, the prairies, and we've heard um, um, Robin talk about uh, uh, J.D. Ma, who took all my good lines, so I have very little to talk about, but uh, Nat Bates and Willie Reed, and the full video is on YouTube. I'm going to go back and edit it and get my ugly mug out of there, because uh, I now know how to work iMovie to at least a very simple degree. Uh, but very, very charming gentleman in the 90s. Um, I've got a few years ago to hit 90. I hope I am in half as uh, good a shape as they are, both physically and intellectually, and what they've learned from Indian Head and what they've contributed. So we go back and we say, well, why did this occur? How did Indian Head um, become Canada's uh, greatest baseball tournament? That's what we, we uh, see it being called. First of all, it started with Western Canada's baseball term. But how did it succeed? How did it compete with Camrose and Foam Lake and Lloyd Minster? And we look back and we tend to ignore Canadian baseball history for the most part. Um, if we watch uh, the betting network, uh, Sportsnet and TSN, we see that everything is focused on hockey, even if they have Blue Jay games. Everything is hockey. The newspapers are hockey. And when we go back, we realize there's a long history of baseball in Canada. If you look at the book that uh, is out where my chapter on the Indian Head Tournament is there, and 34 or 35 uh, far more uh, erudite authors than I am have contributed, baseball in Canada has a long history from the 1860s, and it's not just an American game, and I think it's important to realize that. And in particular in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Alberta, we see in the 1900s, uh, obviously we had very much an agrarian society. The flip between rural and urban, uh, probably 80-20 rural in uh, 1910, it's probably 80% urban right now. Uh, towns that I used to drive through, uh, got driven through when I was a kid, um, and I, I come back, uh, they've disappeared. Um, there's 600 people town, uh, in, even in 1970s, about 60 today. And when I first visited Robin in Indian Head last year, I, 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 I tell, told her this story, although I, I probably shouldn't have. I said, you know, when we, we drove to Cousins in Mooseman, 
or to Winnipeg, uh, the only t interaction I had with Indian Head was stopping for gas. And I sort of knew there was an experimental farm here, and Robin has convinced me they weren't experimenting on humans, so that's a good <laughs> thing. Um, but I was, I was blown away. And uh, I was blown away by Main Street, by the museum, although I must admit, I go, how is she ever going to get this done for next year? Uh, but it was impressive. Mm -hmm. And I think probably a legacy has continued um, early 20th century through today, where it's very different. Uh, how many small town theaters like this have been abandoned, have been destroyed? I, I look at the old post office then. It's for sale, what a beautiful building. All the, all the preservation of history. And I think the museum with its broad focus, uh, Robin finally let me go up back and see what's there. She, she you know, hit it for me last year. Uh, <laughs> but to see that and to, to sense it and to put it in the context of the Rockets here for a relatively short period of time, four years, and the tournament in its big form uh, for I guess nine years, uh, I think it's gone away we have people who watch the games, who are children of the organizers, who have memories. And I think for things like that, it's not only important to preserve the physical record. Ken McKay, obviously a key factor in preserving things that we can look back. We can look back at, go to the website, you see correspondence, you see the minutes of the Indian Head Athletic Association, you see the minutes of the Indian Head Rockets, you go through, you see the fighting on the committee, you see the deficits. As a tax lawyer, I kind of miss that there are no financial statements because I'm looking <laughs> for the unreported income or things like that. But it's, it's absolutely impressive what he saved. Still trying to find things. You know, we, I think Rob and I, who's the accounting firm? Where did they go? They're mentioned in the minutes. We've got to find those statements. Um, because aside from the, the interplay of the community with an African-American team, we look at the, the seemingly raging success of the tournaments. 12,000 people for a final game, 25,000 people. I, I, I drove around the town again today and I'm like, <laughs> I don't think Rob, did we ever find out where, and he's just trying to point, no, it's over there, that's where they had it, that's where the racetrack with the diamonds and, you know, I, I, can, only, I can only find things if there are mountains there now and an ocean. So I get on, I, you know, grid roads, they don't help me, I'm not much into, uh, Cartesian geography anymore, uh, I need Google Maps. Um, but just amazing, and you saw that backdrop of the picture. You see the cars, and you go to the minutes of the museum, and you see how many people on the committee? 12 people on the parking committee, whatever the number is, I'm making it up. 40 people parking cars, you saw J.D. Ma. He never told me this about how uh, he, uh, you know, someone counted all the parkings. Uh, the license plates from different states and provinces. Um, but the incredible involvement of the community, and uh, that is certainly an impressive part. So how did, how did the tournament start? Well, just the other day, and even before I bought the USB, which of course you should all do and, and finance the museum, is uh, someone sent to us a uh, uh, 1939 Indian Head tournament. You know, I just go, I. I saw something in the 1920s, and I thought baseball died in the Depression. There's a tournament in 1939. War basically ended thing. Uh, guys went to war. You know what we do in, in war is we send our our bright young athletes to uh, to fight, and we hope they come back in peace. But old guys like me, we would never go. So uh, probably if we had to, we wouldn't have any wars. But post World War II, we a great prosperity. We were in the process of urbanization. If we didn't realize it in a small town, I, I go to my grandmother's farm and I've been there recently, but when I went there in the 1970s, uh, the number of bunkhouses for the people to bring in the harvest that were there. But why do we have all these? Well, we needed you know, 16 people or whatever to do it or whatever it was, and it wasn't. It was only a small 1,100 acre farm that they barely could make a living with. Now I think uh, somebody who's buying up all the farmland says, oh, we don't look at buying farms unless they're 10,000 acres and things like that. And you know, they have the, the Roomba harvesters that don't even need people anymore to do things. But um, So we saw that prosperity, the soldiers coming back, influence of the recovery of the economy, money pumped in from the war. And we saw a, uh, the Indian head 
business community, Jimmy Robeson, Spear, Spearhead. I, I'll probably get a lot of things wrong though, but a curler, general store, baseball. I don't know about his hockey career. Maybe you know, can tell us. I don't didn't see him playing hockey, but he and some other guys. Um, and I'm probably gonna get Steve Niven, Graham Williams. Yeah, uh, Graham Williams' son was uh, here, not here now. He was here yesterday. The the Rockets. The Indian Head Athletic Association, go back to the minutes, and Robin and I had been working on, on the Rockets and trying to fit pieces and the story together. And then we looked at him, and then she goes, oh, have you looked at this Indian Head Athletic Association? And you know, she pulls out the minutes back to 1920, wherever it was. And we just see sort of uh, how it existed as a community sports organization. And obviously, you, know, you weren't traveling Far, to, you know, you're not traveling to BC to play hockey like you might now for a, a select team. And he saw guys who say, "What do we do post-war to keep the community active? To bring, you know, basically bring in tourism uh, in a sense, but to bring all these people from Minot, North Dakota, from Idaho, from Alberta. How do we deal with it?" As JD Ma mentioned, and, and you know, at theplate.com, no need for the www. You have to go visit it if you have any interest in baseball because there are not just the Rockets. Rockets are a small part. He's chronicled baseball history in Western Canada back to 1900 and before with an incredible amount of work. And, and without him and Ken McCabe, I, you know, I'd be up here and I'd be mumbling and I'd be done in five minutes and say, and people would be going, was well, that all there is? And I go, yeah. It led to Robin and I having the ability to go through and see all of that. And, and those two gentlemen uh, were uh, unbelievable. The interesting thing, of course, about looking at small town baseball or small town hockey or something, you know, we all know what happened in Major League Baseball. Thousands of people have written on it, sometimes accurately, sometimes not. Myths get repeated. Uh, same thing in hockey. Do people write about Indian Head? Do they write about the Saskatoon gym? Do they write about the Medicine Hat Mohawks? No, they don't. They don't particularly care because we have this hero fixation. But when we look at the Rockets, when we look at the Medicine Hat Mohawks, when we look at the Lloyd Minster Meridians, which I think is one of the greatest names because it's, I think the ballpark was in Saskatchewan. That's pretty well all, all Lloyd Minster <laughs> Saskatchewan kids. Uh, we, we see the community involvement and the impact on kids. And, um, I should probably get a slide once in a while. You probably uh, which Just, just uh, put your finger on the track. It doesn't matter. There okay. you go. So, uh, yeah, I think somebody said three minutes a slide, so I hope you don't have anything to do by uh, 10 o'clock tonight. Uh, <laughs> uh, no. How did I... Wait a minute, I thought... We can go back. I, how do I go back? Okay. <laughs> just the arrow keys, okay. Yeah. Sequence so that I would uh, get lost and all. So here's the first ad $2,000 in prize money. It's pretty typical, you know, cameras, foam lake, uh, newspapers.com. They didn't have Indian Head in there, so last year when I was looking at it, I was picking out the, the things that uh, Robin had and her uh, workers uh, had, had copied and, and put there. Uh, online now, so I've gone back through some of it, and luckily I didn't make too many errors. But uh, Nick Metz, we of course all know Nick Metz, don't we? Hockey player. Uh, I didn't really know how he sort of knew the name, but it, whether it was Nick or Sam or Billy uh, before that. Um, as you can see, August 47, I think she switched the size of me. <laughs> July 46, the first slide. And this is, if you look at that book, and uh, I need to plug the book uh, because I want to retire on the royalties, uh, but uh, unfortunately the publisher has informed me that I get paid nothing and uh, no royalties, so uh, it's not exactly going to be my uh, career when I uh, fail law, but um, 
Uh, we, we don't have any books yet from uh, the publisher. We, we've got those couple that the, uh, the Saber sent us, but uh, we'll be getting some at the museum and you'll be able to buy them. And so the profit over cost will go to the museum rather than to uh, Jeff Bezos, which I know is going to be disappointing to some of you. <laughs> Interestingly enough, at least to me, um, I found one of the things, uh, the, the difference between the community and the players and the media and the players. And I found it interesting because I'll, I sort of denoted, well, sort of means I did denote, you know, a very um, element of <coughs> subtle and not so subtle racism in the papers. And uh, what's amazing is how that didn't influence communities like Medicine Hat, Indian Head, Lloyd Minster, into how they treated the African American players who came out. I mean, you just read, this is Dave Dryberg, and, uh, you know, uh, read TN. Some team will get the idea to bring in a couple of dark horses from the US. Well, African American teams had been barnstorming on the prairies at, at least since 1910. They'd come up, they <coughs> want to make money, they were, segregation prevented them from playing in the American and National Leagues. But, you know, here's the, here's, He's not the Indian head news. He's the leader post. And he's musing about how Indian head is going to be affected. Oh, is it going to kill off our ball? We don't really want it. Well, it's kind of like when Toronto tells us to do something. We kind of do the opposite, don't we? And I'm sure the Maple Leafs, I'm sure some of the fans, they'll win the cup uh, sometime this morning. But, uh, you know, again, do we want good baseball? Do we want towns? And, and so that was kind of the the introduction to this, and, and I looked at it and went, wow, you know, uh, and there are a lot of things. Okay, wait, hit the wrong button. Um, so again, uh, greatest baseball tournament, another, uh, lots of great ads. If you, if you uh, uh, have access to newspapers.com, uh, or you're thinking, well, if you're thinking of getting it, don't, because if you're a procrastinator and you want to get lost for ages and ages in there, you pick your subject and search, and you'll find all sorts of things, uh, even if you're not a baseball fan. So, Jimmy Robson, Graham Williams, organized the tournament, a whole lot of uh, fan success early, great crowds, lots of revenue. It wasn't clear financially how the tournament would do, uh, was due. Uh, as a tax lawyer, I always deal with unreported income, and some of my clients might be less than honest. But I always have to explain to the prosecutors that unreported revenue doesn't equal unreported income because you have expenses. And putting on the tournament was hugely expensive. You go through and you see, go through the notes and you see, here's what we did. We had to build the stands. We had to, the baseball, they go, $400 a year for baseball. 1950, that's a lot of money. That's for the tournament. And probably going around to kids, give me that ball back, kid. Yeah. Probably, you know, I mean, some of you may have got chasing the balls and, and that. Uh, uh, so, um, but, I mean, without Jimmy, we wouldn't have had a tournament and the other guys were there. And so, interestingly, so we had the tournament for a couple of years, great success, no local team. Brandon Gray's, I, I'm always afraid somebody's gonna ask me a question, well, who won the tournament in 1949? And I go, look over there, squirrel. Well, I go back to my paper and try and remember it. I, you know, I can, I can tell you how many goals Bobby Orr scored in 1969, but you know, things that I didn't learn before I was 12 in terms of sports, I don't remember off the top of my head. I try and remember the important things, the tone of what was happening. So we've got a tournament, it's successful, it's got people, and then we look at it and go, what don't we have? And what we didn't have is the local team. You know, there were local ball players, and you know, they played, I don't even want to pronounce it. They played Moosin, and I was gonna pronounce Wolseley, but I'll probably pronounce it wrong. Um, and we don't have a team. So why not try and recruit players from the area? Why not recruit? Well, you know, the, 
1950, the Bentleys were up with Saskatoon Gems or the Delisle Gems. Regina had a bunch of good players, a lot of hockey players, a Nick Metz who was the slide of sorts. But <coughs> Jimmy Robson and the others, they, I think they wanted to think a little bigger. And what I didn't find, you know, you always, you look at history and you got blocks that you can fill in. It's, it's great, it's good. But there's always these questions like, why recruit Americans? Why look to African Americans to fill the team? I think the answer to the second one is easier than the first. And it's, the second, first one is probably, there weren't enough good ball players to compete with Saskatoon and Regina and Moose Jaw. Um, so, just like anybody else, any business say, where can I get my best return? Where can I get capital and players of capital? So, 1950, and this is, you know, I couldn't, couldn't figure out how to, I'll get skills in Photoshop after I do uh, uh, iMovie. Um, you can ignore that, that uh, jockey. Um, but it, it's also interesting somehow when things get re reported in the paper, in one article, we assume it's true. And today we look on Facebook and as you know, everything on Facebook is true. <laughs> uh, so, but uh, we're looking to hire a semi-pro club. And this is a great article that says, Rogers Hornsby is going to help us out. And yeah. He's gonna find it. And for those of you who don't know, and I'll probably get it wrong, Roger Hornsby is the greatest right-hand uh, batter in, in baseball history in terms of batting average and, and OPS and all things like that. I think his lifetime average second highest to Ty Cobb, 358. For those of you who aren't asleep by those statistics, very impressive. So it gets repeated. People go, Roger Hornsby recruited the Rockets. Great. But I look at it and I go, he, Jimmy and Graham and Steve and whoever the other guys were, I can't remember my apologies, they went down to Wichita in May 1950. National Baseball Conference, uh, Congress, basically the umbrella for amateur teams, have their meeting there. And just like, I sorry, bring up the Canadian Tax Foundation, you go there and you network and you schmooze and you try and tell people how impressive you are. They went down, similarly with baseball, went down to look for baseball players, a baseball team. Roger Hornsby was managing Beaumont, Texas that year. So I had to get out my ruler, which I think is on Google Maps, say, Really? Is that, how, how could he be in Wichita at that time? Because people said, well, Roger Hornsby signed up his team. And here's where the importance of original documents is there. Because the newspaper isn't original documents. They weren't in Wichita, and they didn't know what happened. They're just, hopefully there's no media here, uh, but you know, they, they get fed something or they just repeat it. And it's tough because you have to go, where's the original research? The museum has, from Ken saving the documents, They've got the original letter where Jimmy is saying, hey guys, come up from Jacksonville, Florida. Come as the Rockets, and here's the terms of her contract. And I'm looking for Rogers Hornsby because he's a great star, and I'm kind of going, where's his name? It's not there. And then, <laughs> Robin knows how much time, it's addressed to somebody called Wayne Clark. When you look on the, it's the letters on the museum website, I believe. Wayne Clark, who's he? I email everybody in Milwaukee, because it's Wayne has an, had an address in Milwaukee. All the Milwaukee Braves historians and look, pretty well look through the Milwaukee phone book. <laughs> Clark, that's a not a common name. Couldn't find any mention of him as a baseball player or executive or scout or anything. Don't know who he was. What I think he was, was basically the, the guy who brought them together. Jimmy Williams and the team was playing in even though they were Jacksonville, Florida, I think they were playing in Brooklyn for that week. Uh, uh, Jacksonville Eagles were a, a, a minor league, a Negro League team. They played in the Negro American Association, I believe. Uh, could be wrong on that. But, um, you know, so nobody was there. No mention of Hornsby. I think he probably just said, hey, you know, go talk to Wayne when you're down in, at the National Baseball Congress. So, the Rockets come up, and of course, I probably didn't put the letter in here, I don't think. Um, the Wichita News, because we all know local papers are often 
boosters. You know, we want our community to survive. We thrive. We want thing. You know, we want to. We have. To, we report the bad news, but we sure like good news. Wichita Eagle, May 19, 1950. What the heck are these Canadians doing? <laughs> what are they doing? A town called Fulmway of about 800 population. And that's the exact quote. I, I'm not that bad a writer that I would write like that. 800 population has a guaranteed prize of $3,750. Don't tell Robin. I don't even know where Foam Lake is. I didn't Google it. But I, somebody told me it's, it's still pretty small. I, I've actually got a few programs I've found from Foam Lake during this hour. It's pretty cool. No lights and no Sunday ball. Well, the lights got fixed, but no Sunday ball. Um, this is what I love about you know, Saskatchewan versus Los Angeles. In the summer, it's light till 9 o'clock and longer, so we can play. Um, interestingly, it said we played three games on three different diamonds. Now, I don't believe I was around in 1950. I don't think I was wasn't born, but Robin and I have tried to figure out where are the three diamonds? And we look at the scorecard too, and you see the draw. You have an even number of teams, and you go, well, how are you playing three diamonds if you've got 24? You know, it's it's probable. I, I haven't seen any scorecards yet for tournament results, uh, but uh, uh, you know, interesting. So, Hundreds of cars to park? I don't know. Have you counted the cars in that photo? Yeah. I count more than hundreds. And, and I just go, how did that parking committee survive? How did those people deal with it? How did, how did you have an organization? You know, you've got people in the sands, but you've got hundreds, if not thousands of cars sitting there. And obviously, Indian Head's population then, same as now, 1,500, 1,400, 1,600. How did they get everybody to come? And so just a... a you know, incredible event of uh, there. So, so the Rockets came up, all black team. Jimmy goes, oh, yeah, bring your bus up and you got to change the name because we like the Rockets better than the Eagles. You can say that, I'm kind of reading into it. And uh, was it Harold or somebody whose dad came up with the name? Uh, my apologies if I got the name wrong. Um, so Rockets were great. Uh, didn't win the Indian Head Tournament. But when we talk about this media relationship versus the relationship of the town to the players, when the Rockets were coming up, um, the bus, I don't think, was probably as luxurious as many buses are today. No air conditioning, no Netflix. Um, some, a lot of us might remember Dick Beddoes of the very well-respected Toronto columnist. Well, he was writing for the Edmonton paper in 1950. And so the first thing the Rockets are going to do, they're going to go to a tournament in Lloyd Minster. Uh, <laughs> Lloyd Minster, big money tournament, just like Indian Head, oh, probably $6,000 prize money uh, in total. First article by Dick. Oh, the Indian Head Rockets bus has broken down, and we don't know if they don't show up, they're going to be forfeited. Okay. Pretty standard reporting, pretty good, factual, no editorialization, nothing read into it. The next day, Dick writes a little longer article, he says, well, and then, and, don't think I put the quote up and I can't remember it, but it's basically, we all know why they didn't show up. They're kind of, you know, a little air quotes, scared to show up. And, and I'm just going, what, what is he talking about? First of all, he hasn't seen him play. This is the first appearance in, in, in Canada. Secondly, they're playing in a you know, professional league, uh, even though non-African Americans, non-blacks, wouldn't have a clue about the Negro American Association. But it's there, and it, it, you see kind of comments on that where race is often, it's not just sports, it's mentioned if there's a, somebody who isn't white, it gets mentioned in, in news articles at that time, through the 1950s. So that's uh, something where, as I said, so, um, were the tournaments a success? Well, they obviously brought a great legacy. Uh, they brought the town together, they brought people from afar, they brought great memories. People today remember those things, they were bat boys, they were, their, their parents were involved. Um, 
great baseball. A lot of, uh, lot of guys uh, who played uh, pro ball afterwards, uh, three made the major leagues, uh, two played in the Negro Leagues, which is now thankfully uh, uh, recognized as a major league. The guys who played in Japan, well, you know, not everybody would have been a great professional, but enough work. I mentioned the huge expenses. As you see here too, uh, I can't remember where that was, uh, whether that was in the Star Phoenix. The Rockets, the colored baseball team, which Indian had imported. You know, there, there's always the reference there. And, and again, as Nat said, I don't think something like that is deliberately pejorative, but of course it, it, it changes how we view things and how we do that. Let me see, a deficit of 87.75 for three months of operations. Where are those financial statements, I ask as a lawyer who deals in financial statements all the time. So what happened? Chief creditors of the people of Indian Head who left $50 a piece, $5,250. So that's 150 people in a community of 1,600. I think today if you tried to get 10% of any population to do anything, whether it's on the internet or do this, you'd get, you'd get five people today, Indian Head or anywhere else. That to me is one of the most incredible things about how the town viewed the community, how they looked at things, how they, how they felt the team, you know, the tournament had been going on for seven, eight, nine, coming on, I think it was the fourth year, and they valued the team. So it's there. Um, next year, 1951. Well, 1950, we talk about Jackie Robinson in 1947 and J.D. Mott, as they say, a Robin stealing all my thunder about how uh, the American and National League took the best of the Negro Leagues and, and just essentially decimated the Negro Leagues of their stars and led to the sort of the eventual downfall early 1950s and also the minor leagues because the players, the finances weren't there and these guys needed the money to live, to work. They, they, they wanted to get paid just like anybody else. So how did, how did the team go? Well, they joined the Western Canada League. Not enough to have all these tournaments. So when we talked to Nat and, and, and oh, sorry, I'm just gonna step back to 1950. We talked about Jackie Robinson. Tom Alston played for the Rockets, first African-American to integrate St. Louis Cardinals. And as tough as uh, uh, it was for Jackie Robinson, you think of Tom Alston, a name that, you know, before I looked at this, I kind of go, yeah, okay, I sort of heard of him. I couldn't tell you what his stats in the majors were. I couldn't tell you how long he played. You're not a star like Jackie is, and you're also in St. Louis versus Brooklyn and New York. So. Nothing's been writ about, written about him, about how tough his life was and, and in the majors. And, and that to me, you know, if I could go back in time and just say, why didn't somebody deal with this? The other guy we'll see in 1952 was Pumsey Green. And Pumsey was uh, the first player in 1959 to integrate the Boston Red Sox. 12 years after Jackie. And Tom Yawkey was one of the most racist owners in the history of baseball. Uh, so racist that Tom Yockey way outside Fenway, they've taken his name down. He did not want black players on this team. Pumsey, uh, in 1951, was playing for the Medicine Hat Mohawks. Now, I think I clipped that from either J.P. Ma's website, so I'm not sure why it's called the Saskatchewan Western Canada League when we've got uh, Moose Guy, uh, or sorry, Medicine Hat Mohawks in there. But Pumpsey, Matt Bates, Willie Reed, and two Kelvin Winters, and I, I can't remember the fifth guy. Uh, I'll ignore the comments from the gallery. Uh, <laughs> came up as 18-year-old kids. I, the other guys might have been a bit older than Pumpsey, Nat, Willie. Came up to Medicine Hat first year to play ball. Why did you come to Medicine Hat? And you watch his video, and I think it's more expansive when you see the whole full, full video, and I'll, I'll edit 
uh, me out. I'll probably leave Carol's uh, uh, face in there, but I've learned how to edit uh, uh, parts of the screen, so it'll just be that, really. But what was really amazing about seeing them in 1951 was how they were so different than a lot of people, how they were different as well from how we perceive Americans. We want to travel. We want to play baseball. We want something different. We want an experience. You know, I went out to work at a hotel in Alberta for my experience, and you know, that, that was my level of daringness. You know, I wasn't going to a completely different culture. And you know, they're coming from the Bay Area, which is we all perceive it as relatively benign in the relations. I don't live in that world, in Nat's world. I didn't live in it. Uh, I can't speak. To it. I can only listen to him and try and understand. But as I said, I'm not surprised he's running for office again. At the end of the video, uh, I think Robin and I both said, we don't care about foreign people financing. We're going to send you money and we're going to work on your re-election campaign. Just a very inspiring guy. Very inspiring. We interviewed Willie the next. Willie's health has deteriorated a bit. But just guys who truly cherish the time of 1951, uh, they were playing for Medicine Hat. Talk about uh, unrecognized stars. We've heard of Jackie Robinson. 1951, uh, you don't see Scepter, Saskatchewan there. Another town, I did look this up because I'm going to go to the Sand Hills <coughs> Museum in the next day or two, which uh, where it is near Scepter, uh, maybe in Scepter, around Scepter. And one of the other people we interviewed was a fellow named George Mahaffey. <coughs> 87 years old, lives in Medicine Hat, just like William Knapp. Great mind, agile, sharp, good physical shape, and talked about his experience playing for Scepter and also playing against the Medicine Hat Mohawks and the Indian Head Rockets. And uh, 1951, talk about unrecognized heroes, Chet Brewer was pitching for uh, Scepter. And Chet, if you look at his career, you, you Google him, 43 years old in 1951, he had played and pitched pretty well everywhere. Mexico, probably in the Caribbean, all over the States, Negro Leagues, everywhere. Uh, one of my treasured items, I got a book signed by Chet, and I didn't even realize it you know, when I was working on this, and then I pulled a book that I hadn't looked at for years, and I, he said it was signed by Chet, and it just made me feel sort of that connection to him. Playing for Scepter, and even at 43, <laughs> George said, you know, George was 18 then, and George was, I don't know, our fastballs might have been the same, but he was way better pitcher than I was. George Manny played first base and tried to avoid pitching at all costs. A month into the season, Chet goes over to Indian Head. Why did he go over? Um, got paid more money. Uh, Nat and Willie, they didn't quite remember exactly what they paid, about a hundred bucks a month. Enough to live on, enough, you know, you're 18 years old, and I assume, well, no, I don't think they said they drank a lot, but you know, it's an experience as an 18 year old. Chet was getting 500, which is pretty good for semi pro ball at that time. He went over, so he certainly, you know, we, we look at guys, uh, Pumpsy Green, those of us with baseball knowledge, we've all heard of Pumpsy Green. If we're, if you know, if we've heard of Jackie Robinson and we're a baseball fan, we've probably heard of Pumpsy Green. A lot of guys haven't heard of Chet Brewer. He's not a, he's not one of the upper echelon Negro League players. He's not Josh Gibson. He's not Martin DeHigo. He's not John Henry Lloyd. And if you don't know those names, you should look up those guys because they're they and many many others are truly superstars who are just prevented from playing in the major leagues by virtue of their color. Uh, a, a shameful. 90 year period in, in major league history. So, um, Robin keeps uh, hiding this when I'm at the museum and checking my pockets on the way out, but the team signed ball. And you see Tom Alston. I don't know why he put his name in, in quotes, because I think it's. Maybe it says Tory and it's a forgery. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you see, uh, I've ordered the, we're, 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 Ebbetsfield Flanner, which produces uh, very fine quality uh, replica jerseys uh, of minor league teams and Eagle league teams, uh, 
is, is getting the Rockets uh, jerseys in. Of course, they're going to be here for the, uh, the uh, opening of the exhibit. And I just said, no, Robin, I've dealt with Evans Field for you know, 25 years. Their idea, maybe when you have the reopening in 2023, they'll be here. Uh, Jesse Blackman, great uh, pitcher, played in Saskatoon afterwards. Uh, so this isn't an Indian head story, but uh, uh, it's a Saskatoon story, so uh, I can tell you about Jesse. Uh, and I, it came to me secondhand, uh, so of course it's as reliable as that. Uh, but uh, it allegedly came from Emile Francis, who of course uh, was a very fine hockey player, goalie, invented the trapper glove, or was the first to use it. He used a baseball glove, coach of the New York Rangers. Emile you know, Francis also had an extensive career in North Battleford in baseball. If you look at North Battleford baseball, which has a tremendous history, Emile is everywhere there. Global World Series, which uh, Jimmy Robinson is part of, Emile was there. So I heard this story about Jesse, and Jesse was the first baseman and a, and a pitcher, and uh, mainly a pitcher, but he played like a lot of guys. He played first base when he wasn't pitching because they had a limited number of players. And Emil allegedly said, he told uh, when he was coaching, uh, he said, well, we had to move uh, Jesse to right field when we were playing in Saskatoon. And my friend said, well, why is that? Well, there were like 10 women above the dugout. Five of them wanted to date him, and five of them were yelling at him because they wouldn't date him again. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, ball, ball players never change, whether it's Indian Head Rockets or... I, I see the minor league Vancouver Canadians, and uh, I, I'm sure there are similar stories. Uh, well, I know there are similar stories because we used to billet players, and they told me them. Um, so we talked about Matt and Willie being the two surviving rockets. That's a picture from J.D. Ma's website. Again, it's 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 a bit of a clunky website, but my God, it preserves history, and it's important. The photos he interviewed people. One of my regrets is. When I was young and, and, and intelligent, I didn't talk to more ball players and get their memories down on video or even on tape. I got a few. I've been organizing local baseball history meetings in Saskatchewan, in, in Vancouver since the early 90s. Half the guys, when I sit there, I got, oh yeah, put Jimmy Robinson on, or Jim, <laughs> Jim Robson, who was a, an announcer, and uh, you know, some other guys, but so many have died now. And, we don't have that connection. We can see the paper, but I think that's why how Robin and Carol and I felt so good talking to Nat and Willie and seeing that. Wanted them so much to come up here, but just to see them talk about Indian Head and their experience. You watch the whole video. I, I, I took those clips out and royalty and things like that, but it's not fake. You go to the 2012 and the leader posted a detailed article and you can just Google that and it'll pop up on the rockets. They were like that when they were 78. Their memories were the same. They spoke of this. Um, so it's there. Now, another thing, my, my friend in Seattle is a huge collector and he uh, typically pillages Canadian baseball ephemera and wards it over me, uh, even though he's in Seattle. But occasionally he throws me a bone and he says, oh, would you like this poster? And I go, yes, I would. <laughs> yes, I would, please. So uh, we, we've been exchanging memorabilia for many, many years. We've never exchanged a dollar. Uh, anything good, if he doesn't have it, he gets it. So he occasionally throws me a bone, but this is one of my favorite pieces. I think that's a, a 1952 poster, uh, if my skill is correct. So maybe somebody with better vision than me can say, is this three diamonds? Uh, I don't know, maybe. Number one, number two, number two, number one. I don't see number three. But again, you know, back to the Wichita Eagle said there were three diamonds. And, and they're, they're clearly were three diamonds. Other newspaper reports say, yeah, we used the third diamond for if a game, you know, if the field was unplayable at one level or we had extra in games. I don't know. It, it doesn't make any difference. You've got 10,000 people attending a game in the final. You've got 5,000 people attending games. Well, it was interesting talking to these guys. And again, I lived in Saskatoon 
2019, reasonably intelligent kid, despite all evidence today, to the contrary. I go through and I go, okay, I've heard of Gravelberg. Adeline Shamrock? I don't know, they're somewhere. Um, Eaton Wolf? Well, I think we passed it on the road here, isn't it? Somewhere, or there's a sign. So, but, you know, growing up in Saskatoon, you never hear of these towns. Gull Lake, I heard of Lake Valley also, it's no idea. Um, Fairway, don't know where it is. But you see, talking to uh, George and Nat and Willie, they go, well, they had to have kings because they wanted to see the Cubans and the Rockets in the, in the final, right? <laughs> they, they didn't want Fairlight and, and Edenwald to play the final because they wouldn't get any fans. They would go, well, we want to see, you know, we want to see Pumpsy and we want to see Nat Bates. Uh, Nat has a great line. I, I, it's on the, on the YouTube video. I said, uh, so Nat, you know, you're 18 and, and he says, well, I could throw a fastball as fast as Chet Brewer because Chet was 43 and I was 18. But Chet had all the change of speed and curves and things. Like so I said, well, how would, you, how would you do against Willie Mays? Of course, Nat never played professional baseball beyond this. You know, wouldn't have had that quality. He says, I'd strike him out because Willie's not in as good shape as me in 90. So <laughs> 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 that's a great line. And the politician, right, always comes up with uh, what it is. <coughs> uh, so here's the... Uh, the um, uh, uh, the 1953 Jim Williams, uh, Big Jim Williams. Uh, uh, Jim Williams was probably about 41, so to Nat and Willie, he was ancient. <laughs> he was ancient, and I look at kids at 40 and I go, you don't know nothing. <laughs> anyway, ask Nat about uh, Jim. Jim Williams had a temper, got into fights with umpires and things like that, got suspended. And I said, well, Matt, Matt, did you know that Jim Williams played in the Negro Leagues? Ah, he's always telling stories. Matt, you tell a lot of stories. Jim Williams played two years for the Homestead Grays, outfielder when Josh Gibson played, very good stats. And you know, I mentioned this, Willie. Oh, I guess he was telling the truth. You know, so, you know, kids, we always uh, never believe our parents or our grandparents, because most of the time, we're exaggerating how good we were. And you know, you can look up my university basketball stats, and I was a superstar. Uh, <laughs> I think 0 0.4 points per game in the Saskatchewan. So, um, and I'm probably exaggerating how good that was. Florida Cubans came in. Uh, we saw the exhibition game. Um, but basically, a bunch of mainly players from Cuba, Hispanic, uh, 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 black players replaced the Rockets. A lot of the Rockets went over to uh, Regina, played for the Red Sox. Um, Nat and Willie got drafted, so they had left for 1953. Um, but uh, how did they do that? I missed that. So uh, you saw that exhibition game uh, footage. The Rockets were playing the Florida Cubans in 1952. So they come up and they barnstorm. They make enough money and they go, hey, we're making way more money playing on the prairies and in northern United States than we would in, in Cuba or anywhere else. Um, so, so they were there, they won the tournament, um, but again, the financial pressure on this. Not only are you running this tournament, but you also got the team in the league. And, and go, we, we try and look, we say, well, how did they, how did they break that down? And, and you look in the papers, and they're not getting, for a league game, they're not getting 8,000 people. Mm -hmm. They're getting 800 or 600. Great, I mean, you think 1,600 people. Rough Riders should do so well to get 50% or 33% uh, of their population out for a football game. Maybe they do. I don't know how big Regina is now. But, but you know, it's, it's, it's just, uh, and I was trying to figure out, you know, ask Nat really, well, how, how do, when you went on these tournaments, how did you get paid? You know, well, we were making $100 a month. But how was the money paid out of the tournament when you won? Because they not only played in Indian Head, they played in Camrose, they played in Rosetown, they played in Foam Lake, uh, wherever they did. So, by 1954, things are kind of, what's that uh, medium that existed before, tele or before TikTok? You know, television and things are coming up, we're urbanizing. 
And you can see the decline of, of sports in the, in the fabric of the small town as, as a spectator. Mm -hmm. And sit so here and go, well, we only want to see, we don't want to watch league games. Uh, you know, our league isn't working because people only want to come and watch the tournament. You know, you don't want to watch, I think they were playing like 65 games, 66 games over the summer. We don't want to watch, as good as they are, we don't want to play these scrubs for 33 games and that. So um, it really became a battle for, uh, for what was happening. And 1955 was the last major tournament. And what happened there is they go, well, you can't be in a league if you want to play in our tournament. And you kind of go, okay, uh, but that meant you're not seeing the best players. You're not seeing the Max Bentleys, you're not seeing the, the, uh, the, the, the Pumpsy Greens, the Tom Olsen, the Jesse Blackers. Um, so the Rockets, again, it's financial pressure, just how much of a deficit can we run? We're not sure. Newspaper reports see 8,775. Another year see 3,000. Without financial statements, you can't really tell. But it's clear there was a limit to how much we could fund this as a community because the, the revenues weren't there to match expenses. So no local team in the tournament. And just, you know, what do you say? We, we never like ties. There are no ties in baseball. Uh, the last game of the tournament ends in tie. It's you know, in darkness, called because of darkness in a tie. And the Notre Dame Hounds, uh, I always thought they were a hockey team with uh, Father, uh, Father Murray, but I mean, they did play baseball, obviously, too. So that's, um, that's the last tournament. Rockets weren't there. Um, what do we draw out of this? Well, J.D. Moss said it best uh, uh, in all of this. Uh, we look at the factors, why, why the Rockets went away, urbanization, financial pressures, uh, very significant factor. Baseball did a horrible job both at the major leagues and the minor leagues of marketing in the 1950s, acceding the, the media and the fans' attention to football. Um, it's, you know, it's not just, and everybody, everybody a bit older than me goes, oh yeah, baseball was so good in the early 60s and the 50s, never been better in the major leagues. And I kind of go, well, do you know in 1966, your beloved Chicago Cubs were second last in the National League in attendance. They drew 600 and some thousand people, you know, and now you can't get a ticket to Wrigley Field, right? But baseball, major league, was not good. Willie Reed, uh, Nat Bates, George Mahaffey, everything I've read, talked to, the George related stories of other African American players who played for Scepter and, and just how, how well they were treated. Not everybody in Canada was perfect, obviously. You, know, you heard Willie talk about how they were called, you know, maybe a bit of rose colored glasses, but to see people go, we invited them into our home. You know, I, I asked Nat, I said, well, did you always eat at the Dominion Cafe? And another part of the video, he goes, well, no, no, you know, we got meal money, so we just ate wherever we wanted. And that sounds normal to us. Yeah. But you're in Birmingham, Alabama. You're in Shreveport, Louisiana in the 1950s. You're staying in the bus while the, the white players eat wherever they want. And again, I can't relate to that. I was going to say I'm too young. But, but I can't relate to what existed in the 50s. I can't relate to what exists today. But I relate to what Willie and Nat and George Mahaffey and everything else I read that, that rings true to that. The media wasn't perfect. All the fans weren't perfect. All the players they played against weren't perfect. But overall, it was, so I say, a lack of overt racism. No. And, and even those of us who were there 
you know, if, if we were there, we're there as 12 year olds, 15 year olds, you know, we don't see the full picture. I certainly didn't see it growing up in Saskatoon. Indigenous community, what, well, that's on the west side of Saskatoon. That's not where I live. Uh, it's hard, and it's hard for us to open our eyes, but I think we did. What are Bessina, Eric, and Russ doing here? Robin found this photo. And to me, it was the greatest photo in the Indian Head uh, collection. It's not a, a baseball team. And the original doesn't have Robin's watermark of Indian Head Museum. <laughs> so I, I don't think it was around in 1952. Les Witherspoon played, I think he had 17 at bats in the Negro League, Major League. Good ball player, you know, 17 more at bats than I had in the Major Leagues. I think I hit 222 in the Little League. We've tried to find whose kids they are. I've gone through Ancestry and I've sent out 20 messages to every Witherspoon in Florida. Les died in Florida in 1982 or whenever it was. And I got you know, no response. Were they his kids? Were they the family's kids? But you, know, you see that and Robin knows where that was, but of course I've forgotten it because I just drone on and on about a lot of things. But, you know, that's in Indian Head. It was in the museum. Somebody kept it. And just to see, you know, kids who just got big smiles on their face. I don't know. I, I'm going to try and go back to one of the photos, and I just don't know if it's, if it's on there or not. Uh, I think we could probably edit it out. It's one of the most important photos, that's why it's not there. Um, in the museum, and when you go to uh, one of the team photos, and I hope it's in the display, uh, because if it isn't, I didn't tell Robin to consider putting it in there, but it's a team photo, and it's up the rockets, and you go, yeah, yeah, a bunch of ball players, great, there's so-and-so, there's so-and-so, a couple guys we don't know. There's a kid about eight years old, and he's turned to the side, he's looking at the team, and his jaw is just wide open. And he's just in awe and amazement at these guys. He's in amazement at these players. And you see that in minor league baseball. You know, major league, yeah, oh, God, I want a foul ball hit by Vladdy Guerrero Jr., things like that. But to the kids, and, and even today in Vancouver, where it's a ball, so four steps below, three steps below the majors. To those kids, if they're not you know, totally immersed by uh, media influences, they look to these guys as real heroes. And I thought that photo, if you can see when next time you're in the museum, and see this kid, and he's just staring there, and, and jaw wide open and going, these are ball players, these are guys. Not a, no, he's, he's, he's just, they're there, and, and that as a, eight-year-old or 12-year-old, or he's not 12, probably about eight. And it's just so impressive to me. And that's where I look and I take the impact of the Rockets. One of the questions somebody asked me, which or I talked about, and I, I, I talked to a number of people, um, it's always interesting because the Rockets were gone at the end of the season. Um, when you look through the history of uh, African-Canadian communities, uh, Amber Valley in Alberta. I wonder if there had been more settled, you know, they stayed there and say, okay, well, we're eight of us, we're going to stay over the winter and do this and become part of the community. Whether part of how that, you know, when they were going back to play in Florida for the fall, because you can apparently, I, probably the only reason to visit Florida, but, you know, would that have made a difference? We're here, we play, we're gone. I don't know the answer to that. That, that's a historical question. It's, it's when you, you know, you, you have to look at that in the historical context, what it brought to the community, the memories it created, and the impact on, on the players themselves and what they took away. Uh, haven't found one thing where some player says, yeah, I was treated badly in Canada. Not, not just Indian hat, but in Camrose, in, in Foam Lake, in, in this. Um, Carol mentioned the Rose Town <laughs> rides. In 1952, I think they, they brought a team up from Philadelphia to play uh, just like the Jacksonville Eagles and you know, things like that. They were only there for one year. But it's just, I think, important for us to remember this history, to look at it, and to uh, just, 
as I say, you don't have to be a baseball fan. You can look at other things, uh, but it's, it's just important for us. So uh, hopefully you'll visit the museum again. Those of you who uh, are looking for a tax donation, oh, you can give money and get a charitable receipt. And, um, but small town museums, they don't live by government grants alone. Uh, they need volunteers, so even if you can't, I know uh, I've told Robin that we're going to run a campaign to get her ousted as president, so, or even worse, make her continue to be president. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I know the community. If you know friends, if you're if you're not from here, but you can you know you can inspire other people in your community to do things. I think that's important. Uh, harder to do in a big city. You know, you go to the BC Sports Hall of Fame. I know the curator is a great guy, but it's it's detached from the community. You see a small town museum, and you go. It's really, and it's a really cool museum. Main Street is cool. I look at all the buildings. <laughs> and Rob, Robin's showing me the picture of the post offices for sale. Mm -hmm. Can I rent that? You know, and then I probably look at the renovation costs and I go, No, that's insane. But it's it's it reflects the rockets. It reflects the time. And again, that's why you know your your community that exists, that thrives, and 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 the people make it. And the Rockets are part of that experience. So just uh, thank you for letting me be a part of that. Thanks to Robin. Mm -hmm. Thanks to Ken McCabe. Thanks to J.D. Ma. It's been uh, a pleasure writing that. There's a little chapter in that book. And as I mentioned, we're going to get some copies and sent to the museum. So if you can <coughs> hold your enthusiasm for a while and, and wait, you'll instead of buying it on his Amazon, you'll get the money to the museum. And, uh, and I uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you.